The reading today is from Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, through to chapter 4, verse 6. And you'll find that on the Church Bibles on page 961. So that's Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, through to chapter 4, verse 6. Before we read, I'll just pray. Lord, may your words be a lamp unto our feet and guide us in your light. In your precious name, amen. Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you're seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers and perjurers against those who defraud labourers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, said the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not be that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going out about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, then they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. On the day when I act, said the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, and between those who serve God and those who do not. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked, 
There will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave them at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. It's not fair. I wonder how many times those of us with children hear something like that during the course of a typical day or week. I've got the smallest slice of cake. It's my turn to sit in the front seat of the car. But I emptied the dishwasher last time. I think probably we all do it as adults as well. We just perhaps keep it to ourselves a bit more. Why am I always left to tidy up the mess around this house? How come that self-serving so-and-so got the grant funding and not me? Why is it that cheating celebrities get the glamorous partners and enormous income? And as we look at how life pans out, uh, there's another question that follows quite quickly on, on the heels of, of that kind of idea of it's not fair, and it's this, why do I bother? If bad people get on in the world, why should I bother trying to be good? Is it actually worth plowing all that hard work into serving Jesus at home, at work, at church? Or, or perhaps if you're here and not yet a Christian believer, you might be thinking, if people who ignore God seem to have great lives, is there any point bothering with God? Does God actually care how we live our lives? Could, can't we just lighten up a bit? Let's show up on a Sunday and then just get on with the other six days, like everyone else. It's not fair. Why do I bother? The people in Malachi's day were feeling this way. If you remember, we're working our way through this record of Malachi's preaching from something like the 5th century BC. God's people had lived in the Promised Land for centuries after Moses brought them out of Egypt. It had been a bumpy ride. And in living memory, they'd uh, had the upheaval of being exiled far away in Babylon. But now they're back in the land, just as God promised. They'd been rescued, and yet life still wasn't quite right. They still lived with a threat of powerful uh, military forces nearby. The, the wonderful promises of a glorious new life hadn't really come good. You see, they, they lived somewhere between a, a past rescue and future glory. But the future seemed like a long time in coming. Morale was low, and many among God's people were turning from his ways, giving up through fear, exhaustion. Today, we're looking at the second half of Malachi's message, and there are two big ideas that God wants to get across. Firstly, he says, get real, see what's actually going on. And then secondly, get ready, see what's coming soon. Um, so firstly, get real. God challenges the people here in Malachi's day to wake up and see what's actually going on. It's a reality a check, a, a call to self-awareness. Four times through this uh, passage that we've just had read, the people have a sort of, wait, what sort of moment? They're surprised by what God says. It's there at the start of the passage. So uh, have a look with me. Uh, chapter 2, verse 17, page 961. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? Well, they just don't know what they've got done wrong. So Malachi fills them in by saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or... Where is the God of justice? The people are calling evil good. They're blurring the boundaries between right and wrong. Perhaps they're ignorant. Seems harmless enough. God must be okay with it. Perhaps they think the Bible's a bit old-fashioned. We've moved on from there. 
They're kind of more going with the flow rather than sticking with what God says. It's like they can't see God's justice and therefore it can't be true. God seems to let everyone get away with anything. And so it's not really worth bothering with him. Or if he is there, perhaps he's just kind of a God of uh, a fluffy love, of acceptance and inclusion. Because in some ways, God's people here are so close to being right. Yes, evildoers can be declared righteous by God. Forgiven. It's wonderful. But that doesn't mean God wants them to stay as evildoers. He's in the business of changing people. The people are wearying God with their words and their actions. And here's the thing, they don't even realise it. Get real, God says. Are you blind to what's actually going on in, in your life, in your community? Does God want to say the same thing to us? There's another call to get real, down in chapter 3, verse 6. We're going to jump through the passage and, and spot these moments. Chapter 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? They've turned away from God and they don't even realise it. They don't know how to return to God because they didn't even know that they'd left him. God is so good and so patient and so consistent. He doesn't change. And that's really good news. It's known as God's immutability, if you like your long words. As the Church of England's 39 Articles puts it, he doesn't have a body that grows older or weaker. He's not made up of different parts that develop and shift. He's got no so-called passions that drive him to wobble or waver. He's eternal. He doesn't relate to time as we do. And yet we can relate to him as our ever-loving, ever-living Father. God doesn't change. And he's been full of patience and, and faithfulness all through history. It's the only reason God's people haven't been destroyed. Even though they, even though we, thoroughly deserve it. Uh, I remember one time we were at a wedding as a family. Uh, it was a few years ago. Children were kind of milling around in the crowd. And as I was uh, standing chatting with a friend, I, I watched as one of our kids toddled off um, across the building, uh, following someone who is a similar size to me. And it was only as uh, our, our child kind of re reached for this guy's hand that they realised their mistake. That's not daddy. And they had such a worried look on their faces, they kind of looked around and tried to work out where I was. I'd not gone anywhere. I'd stayed in exactly the same place, but it was such a big shock when they realised they weren't with their daddy. Well, God's not gone anywhere. He's unchangingly faithful but there's a call here to get real. They weren't half as close to God as they thought they were. They, they'd wandered off. They needed to return to him. I wonder, could the same be said of us? There's a third wake-up call in verse 8. This call to get real. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. So God's people, they're turning up to worship, doing the right sorts of things, but in reality, they're robbing God. Uh, back in the time of Israel under the Mosaic Covenant, they were meant to set aside 10% to support the priests. And instead, they're keeping the money for themselves. Perhaps household budgets were tight, costs were high, there wasn't much to spare. God says, get real. See what's actually happening. They're robbing God, stealing. You thieves. Now, after Jesus, God doesn't set us a 10% figure. Instead, he calls us to be generous with our money, our time, our energy, our homes, everything. What would God say as he looks at our finances, our diaries? There's a call here to wake up, to get real. 
One final time, verse 13. You've spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You've said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like the mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. It's sort of come full circle back to the start of the passage, hasn't it? They're speaking against God, making false claims about him. It's not worth serving God. Just do what you like. You'll be fine. God won't stop you. You're better off building your own life than investing in God's. Don't bother with all that heavy sin and confession stuff. That's just full of negativity. Crush your mental health. Those are the sort of things they might have been hearing. And it's a dreadful distortion of God and and his ways. And they don't even realize they're doing anything wrong. What have we said against you? They're asking. It's a shock to them. They're outraged. How dare you call us out on this? We're God's people. We've got the buildings, the Bibles. Get real, God says, to them and to us. Sometimes we really need a shock to wake us up to reality. Uh, I was out uh, cycling in the villages uh, west of Cambridge a few months ago. I know I'm not a mega cyclist, but I take a bit of pride in the fact that I'm not often overtaken uh, by others. Uh, So when a couple of guys all kitted up in uh, Lycra come past me, um, I pushed hard to catch their slipstream and kind of tag along for a bit. Uh, They were very friendly. I happily caught my breath. Then I began to wonder why they were going quite so slow. Perhaps they'd just been showing off earlier, and uh, actually, I was faster than them. Well, a few hundred metres more, and uh, uh, I thanked them for the tow and, and sped up past them, feeling quite pleased with myself. They didn't last very long. <laughs> About 30 seconds later, they shot past me, and there was no way I was catching their slipstream that time. I think they'd probably been humouring me all along. Uh, I was suitably put back in my place, uh, not nearly as speedy or as fit as I'd thought. Good reality check for me. Sometimes we need that in life. We need to get real. That's what God's doing through this passage this morning. Perhaps we've said and thought and done things like the Israelites. We've tried to tell ourselves that things which God calls evil aren't actually that bad after all. Just a little slip. Just one more time. I can always stop when I want. God's still pleased with me because of Jesus. I'll give him a bit more of my time next year. This year, I just need a bit more, a bit more me time. It's the sort of lines we can feed ourselves very often. And I just wonder, are we more like the people of Malachi's day than we care to admit? It's easy not to realise just how far we've wandered from God and his ways. It's sometimes called a sort of gospel gap, the distance between what we say we believe and what we show we actually believe in the way that we live. The difference between the songs we sing on a Sunday and the songs we sing through life, as it were, Monday to Saturday. Get real, God says. It's a reality check. Wake up and see what's happening. It's far worse than being left in the dust by two high-speed cyclists. It's not just a bit humiliating. It's wearying the Lord God of the universe. It's robbing him. It's speaking arrogantly against him. Get real, God says. He's waiting patiently for perhaps some of us here to wake up to what's happening. And then there's a second call from God in this passage as well. Get real and get ready. Uh, Some things you have to prepare for uh, ahead of time. Uh, Kids' birthdays, you can't just wait until the the day before. Going to uni, you have to get all the kit together. Uh, We sat and watched the Queen's funeral procession on Monday. It's amazing to see those huge numbers of people involved from all around the world. I think I heard it's a mile and a quarter long. You can't put something together that size in 10 days after the Queen has died. 
So there's this thing called Operation London Bridge. It's been years in the making. And when the sad day finally came, well, everyone was there in their place, uh, ready, wearing the right kits, ready to honour Queen Elizabeth II. And God's message through Malachi was, get ready. And it was for something even bigger than a state funeral. So take a look at chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to move fairly fast through this. Um, God says there, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord who you're seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who will stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men, these priests, these Levites, who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. Perhaps you recognise some of those famous words from Handel's Messiah. Malachi like is saying there's going to be a massive spring clean. God, get ready for God's arrival. Because otherwise, there will be trouble. So look down at verse 5 with me. I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. So they've put God on trial because they think he's not acted with justice. But actually, they're going to be the ones on trial. Stood before the judge, like we were hearing earlier in the children's talk. It's coming, says God. Just you wait. God wants his people to be ready for that day. To show some fear and respect towards God, rather than constantly questioning his goodness and justice. Get ready for that day. And that's going to involve returning to the Lord. So we're just over the page, middle of verse 7. God says, return to me, and I will return to you. It's not too late to come back to him, even at the point where he's sending this challenging message. The door is open, his arms are outstretched, ready to welcome the wanderer home, any of us. Get ready. And it's going to involve a radical change in priorities. But then it's totally worthwhile. God tells them to throw themselves into it wholeheartedly. Down in verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. What a prospect for God's people. This is the glorious future they want. Now I should say this isn't a promise that if we give God 10% a tithe, then everything will go well for us that he'll pour out his blessings on us. Uh, that sort of idea is popular in some parts of the church around the world. Um, perhaps you've come across it. Uh, sometimes called the prosperity gospel. Uh, the idea that God promises us uh, that we'll be healthy and wealthy if we trust him and follow him. I'd love to spend uh, more time digging into this, but there's, there's not really time today. Perhaps the big thing to remember is that these words to Malachi were spoken uh, to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament Israel, um, in the land which God had promised to them in that covenant. In Jesus, we don't have a physical land at the moment in the same way, but we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. So we live now still waiting for our promised land, the new creation, and we store up treasure in heaven, and that's the safest place to invest, the best returns. In Jesus, we have something even better than fertile fields and bumper harvests, better even than fast cars and designer labels. 
We have God himself. So these verses in Malachi aren't a promise to us of health and wealth. They're a call to get ready for that coming day by living generously now. Whatever we have now belongs to the Lord, and it's given to us so that we can serve others. Get ready, God says. And wonderfully, there were some people in Malachi's day who took this seriously. Did you notice that beautiful little snippet down in verse 16? Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. They had a home group, if you like. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. It's not glamorous or dramatic, is it? They, they feared the Lord, they talked together, and the Lord listened. Their names were written in his book, John, Ruby, Alex, Ruth, Ziang, Emily, Ephraim, Sonny. The list goes on. God's treasured possession. What a day. There'll be no more complaining about God's justice then. There'll be a division. And there'll be deliverance for those who serve God. Those who know him as father those who've been saved by his great covenant love. Get ready, is the message of Malachi. And it continues on into chapter 4. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. And you will trample on the wicked. There will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Again, there's this division. A terrifying day for some. A day of healing and freedom. For others, such a contrast. Uh, we, we've seen wildfires on our screens this year in the heat wave in the UK, in Spain, in France, in California, in Australia. Terrible destruction. And the contrast with the, the healing sunshine. Calves playing in the fields. A picture of contentment and joy, victory. Get ready for his coming. Verse 4, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb, at Sinai, for all Israel. In other words, get ready, stick with God's word, God's covenant. Don't, don't move on from the Bible. Get ready. Verse 5, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. If we had more time, we could turn over just a few pages and uh, into the Gospels and see how John the Baptist is this Elijah figure. And also how this day of the Lord is, is kind of split in two by Jesus. He comes first in person to the temple to warn. He'll come a second time, a great and dreadful day, a day of destruction for many, but also a day of rescue for others. Get ready, is Malachi's message. Did you know it's 91 days until Christmas? Three months today. And I'll tell you what, the shops are ready. We've started discussing carol services. 
But there's a far more important day to be ready for. That's the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And God says to us today, get ready. Are you ready? So there's these two challenges from God through Malachi today. Get real. Wake up and see what's actually going on in relation to God. And get ready for what's coming soon, a day of division and wonderful deliverance. And I think this is just what we need to hear when we're thinking, it's not fair. One day God will come and put everything right. And that includes us, so we need to get real and get ready now before it's too late. And why do I bother? One day God's going to come and it will all be worthwhile. We'll be his treasured possession forever. Those who know the Lord Jesus. So as I come to a close, I want to repeat some profoundly encouraging words that were read during the Queen's funeral on Monday from 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain.